Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our topic matter is on diaper rash. Now I geared this for infants, but as my husband reminded me, we do have an aging population in which we're utilizing more and more adult diapers. So this would um, apply to both infant as well as adults and hopefully alleviating some of the symptoms associated with diaper rash. First of all, um, it's a common dermatitis of infants or any person who's in a diaper that is exposed to any type of urine, um, uh, feces, or moisture in, that, in the particular diaper area that can lend itself to either yeast or bacterial infections. It doesn't have to be that way. It can start off with just an irritation, but it can lend itself to what are called secondary infections as well. The causes. Now, we usually think in terms of, oh geez, the babysitter's not changing the diaper enough. And I would say that could and is possibly most likely the case. But we have other things when, when we have good moms and good babysitters that are changing the diapers that can contribute to diaper rash in both infants and adults. So, first of all, prolonged contact with irritants, which include urine, stool, and possibly detergents or chemicals found in disposable diapers. Things you have to rule out. So, always running, uh, if you're using non-disposable, I know most people use disposable nowadays, look for or make sure you're putting your uh, diapers on a second rinse. And if you're using disposable, gosh, I know uh, at our store we have the chlorine-free, chemical-free types of diapers that will be a lot less irritating uh, to baby or to um, in adults. Now, when we're talking about uh, diaper rash, besides just the continued exposure to fecal matter or urine, we have other potential causes when we're looking at this, it's interesting, I separated out breastfed babies from formula fed babies because they can have different causes. Now, in breastfed babies, um, something usually in the mother's diet is just too acidic. And that can include pineapples, oranges, tomatoes, uh, too much refined carbohydrates, processed foods, or just plain and simple nutrient deficiencies. I have a lot of breastfeeding mothers coming in whose doctors are telling them, oh, you'll get everything from the diet, don't worry about it. And that is absolutely false. Um, I know I was in agriculture for a lot of years. We do not get the nutrients from our food anymore and don't let anybody convince you otherwise. And there's a lot of good testings on food to say otherwise by the National Institute of Health. Our foods nowadays, nutrient deficient, they're on the shelves to look pretty. Your odds of getting better quality foods rise obviously when you get organics or sustained organic uh, produce. But just a warning, if you're breastfeeding, please don't just rely on your diet. Formula fed babies. It can be an allergic reaction to the formula. Um, a lot of babies are sensitive to the milk proteins or to soy protein. And so looking at one that is um, a little bit more hypoallergenic nowadays, looking for maybe the rice-based types of formulas or what are called the comfort proteins or goat milk formulas are a good option, making sure that they're rich in essential fatty acids. Oftentimes you find these... Um, uh, formulas that are high in trans fats, and you know they'll say the fat content, but they're in saturated fats, but they'll be very low in what are called essential fatty acids that are necessary for reduction of inflammation and for baby's brain. So this has to be examined. Um, introduction of cow's milk, particularly at an early age. Now, I know my uh, pediatrician, particularly for my second and third son, said do not introduce regular milk to your baby until age two. And the reason why is their digestive tract cannot break down the caseins, uh, the large protein particles in the milk, so it can lend itself to a lot of hypersensitivity and it can actually destroy the baby's digestive tract to where you're going to have them be hypersensitive to a lot of things as life progresses. So a uh, suggestion would be please don't introduce cow's milk uh, until age two. Sticking with the formulas or the uh, broken down types of protein uh, proteins that you're going to find like in the comfort proteins or goat milk is going to be much more acceptable and less inviting of potential problems later on down the road. 
Um, antibiotic usage. Now we have, I know one of our pediatricians in town that whenever uh, she puts uh, babies on a um, antibiotic, she's sending them over to the store to get, grab what are called probiotics. Now see, babies' digestive tracts don't have real thick layers of these good bacteria that have built over with time. And so when you put them on an antibiotic, it can really destroy their good bacteria, lending themselves to hypersensitivities, poor nutritional um, uh, imbalances or nutritional deficiencies, and actually can lend itself to sepsis, which is what happened to my what's now 20-year-old when he was age two that landed him in an emergency room to untie his intestines because these antibiotics had destroyed all his good bacteria. So that can lend itself to a lot of high bad bacteria and yeast issues which can contribute to diaper rash and other infections. Wheat or gluten grains introduced before age one. That's why we have rice-based cereals. Rice-based cereals are the best to start baby with. No, please don't go be feeding them the oatmeal and bread and everything else. Never before age one. Because once again, the glutens and those types of proteins found in gluten products such as wheat, oat, barley, are very difficult for babies to break down and you can make them extremely hypersensitive. If they're gluten intolerant, oh heaven help you, which about a third of our population is, they'll have tons of gas, um, lots of bowel problems and can end up with baby eczema, all kinds of wonderful uh, triggers uh, autoimmune early onset early uh, autoimmune disorders among babies as well too. Um, when you're doing foods, um, adding in uh, one food at a time, I know that um, the pediatricians I had for my sons didn't recommend adding any type of food in until age six months. Uh, and I know a lot of people, I mean I had these big huge babies and so it was very hard. I had to keep my breast milk up to keep up with their um, appetites. But I can tell you though, if you do the rice cereal and then you gradually add in one type of food at a time, particularly your non-acidic um, uh, types of foods, which are going to be primarily your vegetables. You always want to start babies on vegetables anyway because you don't give them so much sugar cravings. If you start them on fruits, yeah boy. But as you're weaning them off uh, the formulas or breast milk also too, you're going to be probably introducing more foods. And adding a food in at a time, starting with like carrots or a squash, really easy to digest spinach, easy to digest types of foods, and adding things one at a time and watching their digestive tract. Um, also, as I've noted before, with the more alkali, the base types of foods that we have in baby's diet, you're going to have less chance of diaper rash and having acidity or an acidic pH in their diaper area. Um, if baby gets diaper rash, you know, in my generation, uh, my mom told me that they used to put us out for about 10 minutes of sun every day and they'd put us out with our bare bottoms and they'd sun us. They just always made sure that our eyes were down so we weren't ever looking at the sun. Sunlight or ultraviolet uh, light exposure is excellent for healing any type of diaper rash for adults or children. Um, changing obviously the diapers frequency, trying to go with chemical free or making sure the detergents are washed out of the diapers is quite necessary in order to prevent further occurrences. Make sure the area is completely dry. You know it's so easy to be in a hurry and you just wipe them off with the baby wipe and slap on the other diaper and they're wet. So you know, having a nice washcloth to kind of dry them off a little bit. You can use a little bit of powder, a calendula powder, or um, there are powders. We have to watch certain powders, especially baby powders, for inhalation by babies. So keeping it a little bit of dusting of, of uh, powder during the day. And then maybe a little bit of oil at night. There's a lot of good oils. Uh, jojoba oil, calendula oil, which is very healing and preventative, especially if baby pees in the middle of the night or and you end up with uh, a wet diaper and them sitting it all night, it'll put a barrier down. Um, zinc oxide creams uh, with the calendula mixed with a little bit of tea tree, 
can help and just a drop or so when you're do putting it on baby's little bottom or adult's bottom uh, on there to form that little barrier. The calindia really will heal uh, the diaper area or zinc oxide and the tea tree is an antimicrobial that kills the bacterial and fungal types of infections but just a couple of drops not a whole lot. Now there's an old-fashioned uh, remedy that's been around for a very long time and you could probably use this in a, in a spray bottle if you choose and you're going to take uh, for every one quart of water you're going to add a tablespoon of a raw apple cider vinegar. I'm not talking the grocery store one that's full of chemicals and process, but like something like Bragg's apple cider vinegar. A tablespoon along with a quart of water and you shake it up each time and you can spray baby and it helps change the pH to where it's a more alkali form so the bacteria uh, don't form and you, they heal much better. But once again, patting baby off dry, making sure they're thoroughly dry before you put the diaper back on either with a little powder or a little something. See, I never used powders on my babies. I just made sure that they were nice and dry. And I can remember very few cases of di diaper rash, only if they were at, at daycare for a lengthy period of time. And uh, under those circumstances, then I was busy trying to heal them up. Um, it, there were a couple of unusual things that I had not run across in my research. We all know that aloe vera works very well for burns and we can use that for esophageal burning, you know, we get sunburns. Aloe vera gel can be very, very soothing because I'll tell you, when they get sore, they scream obviously because it's painful. It's like a burn and then you get urine on it and it burns again. So that calendula oil along with a little aloe vera could be extremely soothing for them. Uh, liquid lecithin every two to four hours can aid the healing. Uh, lecithin comes from soy, but it's very healing and very emollient as well too. We talked a little bit and touched upon diet a little bit earlier, but when we examine uh, obviously the types of foods, we have to avoid the citrus, juices, tomatoes, strong spices, alcohol, which you shouldn't be doing if you're breastfeeding anyway, coffee, junk foods, processed carbohydrates, and Gluten, obviously, from a gas standpoint, we want to kind of avoid the, the broccolis and the cauliflowers and the cabbages also. But these foods will make uh, baby's urine and poopy very, very acidic. Uh, you want raw fruits and vegetables, especially carrots. And, and there's some studies regarding this, especially with carrot juice. It's very alkaline to the blood, alkaline to the blood, and in turn can make baby's pH when mommy's breastfeeding much, much better uh, as far as not causing those uh, acidic rashes. Uh, try to eat gluten-free grains as much as you possibly can until you know later on, obviously, whether your baby's gluten intolerant, considering one-third of the population now is. So your baby may be crying and screaming and you can't figure out why, you know, baby's got uh, all the swelling and gas and everything and you got rid of all the broccoli and cauliflower and everything could be that all the gluten grains you're eating are causing a problem. So keep that in mind as well too, that if you have a baby that's particularly seeming to have a lot of gastrointestinal issues and diaper rash issues, eat a gluten-free gluten -free types of grains, which would be rice and sprout. Um, we touched upon already the formulas. Now, when we're talking about supplements that aid in a bed, uh, the healing process, you know, if we don't have adequate amounts of B vitamins and adequate amounts of buffered C, I'm not talking ascorbic acid from your local warehouse place, but natural vitamin C as in a, a buffered C, the skin tissues can't heal. And when you lack good fats in the diet, you can't keep moist and you can't reduce inflammation. A lot of mother's diets lack nuts, avocados, essential fatty acids that are great for baby's brain and the bottom. So here is a list of supplements that I strongly suggest that every mother add. Now, the vitamin A is optional. If baby tends to have a lot of bacterial or yeast infections, I would go ahead and take the additional amount of vitamin A. And if you're formula, formula feeding, you can give baby like a 2,500 IU vitamin A dosage. And I know doctors kind of panic about vitamin A, but it can take a year with high amounts of vitamin A before you would ever see anything that would be a problem. Um, infant vitamins, and, and I have more doctors 
saying to my customers, formula fed babies, ah, oh, they don't need a vitamin. I disagree strongly uh, with that based upon the research because most infant formulas do not have adequate amounts of Bs or adequate amounts of zinc, A, E, or C. They just don't. So most of the vitamins are geared towards those particular elements and there's infant drops that are wonderful They can give baby that can help not just provide nutrition from overall health standpoint, but from a diaper rash as well. Last but not least, the probiotic acidophilus. They give baby the good bacteria in order to fight off the yeast and bacterial infections. Once again, when they get infected, they're gonna be in pain, they're gonna burn, and it's gonna take you a while to get it gone. If mom takes a probiotic also, it comes through the breast milk and we give baby good bacteria. Obviously, if babies on antibiotics, we always want to do the probiotic. I hope this is helpful. If you need a copy of this, you can get it at any of the vitamin and herb stores in Lompoc, Bealton, Napomo, and uh, Santa Maria. Next, we're going to be moving on to a special section on airbrushing. Thank you. last show we talked a little bit about detoxification regarding food. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about dry brushing, not air brushing. I was hoping you might catch that little joke. Anyway, dry brushing has been used for centuries in other cultures and there are lots of things or ways that you can do it, but standardly there are brushes this size or with a long handle. And what it does basically is you're exfoliating the skin and moving along, and this is what it's good for. Cellulite, lymphatic system, your immune system, detoxification, oh my gosh, the list goes on. You think, some of the studies have shown that if you do this for 30 days, your skin can look anywhere from five to 15 years younger. So this is definitely something in which you can get your body to detoxify and aid and abed the beauty process as well. Now in order to properly dry a uh, brush, you have to know how to do it. Number one, you always work towards the heart. You never work away from the heart because literally that can affect the valves and how the blood pressure works. So you always start at the local extremities and hopefully you're in a shower when you're doing this, five to 15 minutes. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna brush in upward motions, upward, all over your body, till you reach the abdominal area, circular motion, your back area, circular motion, the neck area in a downward motion, ending with your arms. And you're gonna try and brush all of the skin tissues. Now mind you now, every 24 hours, the top layer of your skin replicates itself. So if you're not exfoliating the skin, and that's why I think guys look so much younger as they grow older because they're always shaving and exfoliating their skin. If you do this on your skin, their circulation and the youthing aspects and detoxification, it'll help. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Terciano. Thank you for the intro. Well, later on, find out how you can add 240 sweet calories a day to your diet and still lose weight, in addition to dramatically lowering your cholesterol. Well, to start, remember the blood type books with blood type diets? Well, now there may be a new innovation to that that has nothing to do with blood type. Well, this came out of the University of Brussels, actually the Vrie University of Brussels. It's called microbiota, or basically your, your probiotics, your natural acidophilus. They discovered there are three different microbiota types. They basically fall into three categories called bacteriides, Prevotella, Ruminococcus. That each person or different people are predominant in different types of those bacteria. Because supposedly, even though you have 100 billion bacteria in your gut, there are very few stable colonies, and it's either one of those three. 
The interesting part about it is this. For example, those people that are high in bacteroids, bacteroids group have more gut bacteria that produce vitamin C, yeah, actually produce vitamin C, B2, B5, and biotin. The Prevotella group, for example, showed higher numbers of B1 and also folic acid producing flora, which is something interesting. Again, it's preliminary, but they are different. They are beginning to discover that we each have a different probiotic type in our body. Now, one of my things I like to blow the roof off for the longest period of time because none of the studies validated it was the testosterone myth in regards to prostate cancer. Years and years and years, thousands if not millions of men are being chemically castrated necessarily because of the myth that testosterone is somehow related to prostate cancer. Does not mean hormones aren't, but as far as testosterone are concerned, it was always a consumption. I get to watch men go through years of suffering and demasculization based upon folklore. Now, basically, this came out of the Journal of Urology. Because for many decades, it had been believed that a history of prostate cancer, even if treated and cured, was an absolute contraindication to testosterone therapy, meaning reducing it, due to the belief that testosterone activated prostate cancer growth. Remember a couple of years ago when we said you had testosterone to a test tube that actually killed the prostate cancer cells? Well, get ready. And it could potentially cause dormant cancer cells to grow rapidly, the researchers said. Well, they did a study where they studied based a small group of men. The men received testosterone therapy while undergoing active surveillance for prostate cancer for a median of two and a half years. The average age was about 58, 59. They had Gleason scores as 6 out of 10 or 7 out of 10, 7 out of 10 meaning usually aggressive. The mean testosterone levels of the group rose from 238 nanograms a deciliter to 664 nanograms a deciliter. And basically neither the PSA nor the prostate volume changed. In fact, here's the kicker. Follow-up biopsy, biopsies of the prostate were formed in all men at approximately early intervals, and none developed cancer progression. In fact, 54% of the follow-up biopsies revealed no cancer at all. Makes you really begin to wonder. Clearly, the traditional belief that higher testosterone necessarily leads to rapid prostate growth is incorrect, said the researchers. They also said an earlier study from Margatella commented on an Italian study that showed that low levels of testosterone were actually associated with aggressive prostate cancer. Basically, they said that during conventional wisdom upside down, low serum testosterone and high risk prostate cancer, the Dr. Morgantella wrote, after seven decades of circumstantial evidence pointing us in the wrong direction, perhaps it is time to consider the once unthinkable. Something to think about now. Next time you go to a doctor and he's still trying to chemically castrate you. Now, to low carbohydrate diets. Interesting, and this was published in the current issue of the Public Library of Science Online. What they discovered is low carbohydrate diets actually reversed kidney failure. Now remember, it's first the mice. Half the mice were put on a ketogenic diet, while a control group maintained a standard high carbohydrate diet. The researchers found that after eight weeks, Eight weeks, kidney failure was reversed in the mice on the ketogenic diet. So our study is the first to show that dietary intervention is alone to reverse the serious complications of diabetics. Basically, remember ketogenic diet was also shown to stop seizures and things like that. And also, two ketogenic diet was recently also shown to reduce the fatty liver, much better than the low carbohydrate diet. Dr. Mobb's research indicates the exposure to the diet for as little as a month, one month, may be sufficient to reset the gene expression in the pathological process leading to kidney failure. He believes the ketogenic diet can also help treat other neurological diseases and retinopathy, a disease obviously that results in vision loss. Something very, very interesting to consider, especially those with diabetics. Back to the swine flu, which doesn't seem to go away. Well, recently in Europe, the swine flu has been directly associated in duplicated studies, one in Sweden and one in Finland, basically to increase risk of narcolepsy. The Swedish study resulted in a four-fold increase in narcolepsy. The Finnish study resulted in a nine-fold increase in narcolepsy. Basically, and it's so bad that they have to actually put it as a warning on the swine flu jab itself. Something to think about in regards to basically that vaccination. It's been pushed too fast. 
None of studies, and I'm sure more is going to come out in regards to it. So something to really consider, considering the World Health Organization really basically fabricated the pandemic and cost millions, not billions of dollars internationally and globally. Something really solid to consider, and especially in light of this. Let's look at Paul Thorson. Who is Paul Thorson? Well, another vaccine. Well, this time it came to thymerosal, the link between thymerosal and autism. Well, he also conducted the studies for the CDC, and I'm surprised this is not in the news, because Paul Thorson research, or the researcher, I should say, on April 13th, remember the main doctor who said there was no relationship between mercury and vaccines and autism, was recently indicted on 13 counts of fraud and nine counts of money laundering. The charges were all related to the funding for the work he did for the Centers for Disease Control showing that there was no relationship between thymerosal and the vaccine. Did this mean Paul Thorson's work was somehow just basically corrupted by it? Yes, more than just corrupted, it was directly corrupted. He even admitted in his emails, saying basically internal emails obtained by the Freedom of Information Act documented discussions between Danish researchers and Thorson, which acknowledged the studies did not include the latest data from 2001, when they took the mercury out of the vaccines where the incidence and prevalence of autism was declining, which would have been supportive of the vaccine connection. The emails also include the request from Thorson to the CDC asking that the agency write letters to the pediatric journals encouraging them to publish the falsified research that other more standard, credible journals rejected because they saw that the studies was excluding certain groups of older kids. The top CDC officials complied with the request, sending a letter to the editor of the journal of pediatrics supporting the publication of the study, what's called a strong piece of evidence that thymerosal is not linked to autism. This guy should be indicted in more than just 13 counts of fraud or nine counts of money laundering. Anybody, anybody makes a vaccine and falsifies research to a vaccine that's forced upon, public, upon the public, or the most vulnerable parts of our society, it should be manslaughter, assault and battery, with something with a little bit more weight besides some guy going in some house or slap on the wrist later on in his life, especially when it comes to children. And now, back to that basically how to lose weight. Well, guess what? It's an apple. An apple a day over an entire year resulted in three pounds lost. But what's more amazing is an apple a day resulted in a 23% decrease in LDL. This was a double-blind crossover placebo studies with one group ate prunes, the other group ate dried apples, the equivalent of one apple a day. Not only that, it increased HDL cholesterol 4%. Thank you very much for that. Wow, thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate it. Once again, do your research for yourself on the subject matter that we talk about and everything else that's out there. Question, look after your own health. Thank you very much.